I'm going to ask you what it is that's drawing you to a workshop like this. So if you'll just kind of reflect on that a little bit as we get going here, then we'll have a chance to share that in just a minute. Uh, so not only what uh, you're here for, but I'd like you to reflect also a little bit on some of your favorite authors and why it is you like them. So those are the things that, that's, that's the little software package running in the back of your brain right now while we deal with some other, other things. And so let me just, if I could, start with a little bit of um, an introduction. I know a lot of you in the room, so I'm not going to go deeply into what I do, uh, only to say that right now my role is to direct something called the Center for Community Transformation at Fresno Pacific University and I'm a professor of community transformation at the seminary. Those are the things that take up almost all of my free time. And the remaining time, I really have the heart of someone who loves the arts. And so what that means is I pursue that in a lot of different ways, often just depending on what I'm trying to experience and, and express. But what does that mean? It means it, it could be mosaic, it could be stained glass. It often is writing poetry. Uh, it's often um, writing prose. And my commitment to the arts has taken me into a lot of corners. It's interesting. It's um, it, You pursue the things that you love. You make time for them mm -hmm. when you don't have time for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I know. I look out at this room. I see how busy you all are. I know the lives you lead. Many of you, and none of you have time for the arts. None. None of you. <laughs> none of you have time to write. And yet, there's something really essential about this. Mm. Something human about this. I would go beyond that to say there's something crucial about you making the commitment to pursue the arts whatever avenue that is and today we're talking about writing why is it crucial because it, it is your gra gr grasp on a part of your humanity mm. that the world wants to suck right out of you mm. you have to no matter what hold on to that part of you mm. and you know I've been in conversations with some of you in the last few months I lead an incredibly difficult, complex life. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I describe my life as, as trying to roll six giant boulders up six different hills all at the same time. Uh, I work with people very different than me. I work trying to get systems in the city to do things that they don't think they know how to do or want to do, whether that's the church or whether that's the university or. And it's just, it's, it, it just takes my mental energy from me. Mm -hmm. What do you have in your life that will give some of that mental energy back to you? That's the big question here. And I think my answer is, in large part, um, the arts. And I might even say beauty. Matthew Arnold, the great English theologian, said beauty is simply truth seen from another angle. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow. And if that's true, then your commitment to writing, your commitment to art, your com you know, whether you're painting or whatever your medium is, it's a commitment to truth. And there is something that feeds our humanity out of that. And so I just wanted to begin there. You know, uh, writing is a, a topic in the Bible. It's just sort of there. We don't ever see it. You know, the, the Bible itself is God's written word to us, right? God said to the prophet Habakkuk, write down the revelation or vision and make it plain on tablets. Mm -hmm. A herald can run with it. Habakkuk 2.2. 2. And there's something crucial in the act of writing that, that completes the message. Just like there's something crucial in the act of telling somebody someone something that completes your understanding of it, too. And I think for me, you know, sometimes I have to put the writing in action before I even know what I think, mm. right? Some of you experience this, you know, interpersonally. You just got to get talking. You don't know what you think. You're a jumble of thoughts. 
If, if you just start talking, you put your mouth in motion, and then the gears of your brain start to work. <laughs> and for many people, those are called external processors. So uh, you gotta find out kind of what your profile is, but there's something in the, the writing and the telling that's really important. God said to Jeremiah, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you. In a book, Peter said to one of the churches, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. I mean, Peter declares his purpose for writing right there. He, he has an intent. He has an agenda. His agenda is to stir up their minds. And there are many agendas in writing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But Peter was clear on his in that particular instance. There's that famous story in Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar, the king who's going crazy, he sees the hand of God writing on the wall. Mm. You have been measured and found wanting, mm. is what he wrote. Did you know, by the way, that's where we get the saying, mm. oh, the, the, the handwriting's on the wall. Yeah. yeah. All right? Huh. In other words, judgment's been made. Mm -hmm. Right? It's been decided. So, writing from ancient times has been uh, valued in the arts, especially in the scriptures. The psalmist in Psalm 45 1 says that the psalmist describes his tongue as a pen writing verses. Mm -hmm. It's a great image, isn't it? So, writing is inherently part of our, our faith journey. Let me just share with you a little bit of, of the writers who've had an influence in my life. Um, I love, you know, just, the list is way too long. I just brought a few today, but uh, I love C.S. Lewis, for example. Let me read you a classic passage from C.S. Lewis. Um, I love, on the one hand, his clarity of thought and his intellect, but on the other hand, he's the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia. So, yeah. wow, that's remarkable. One of the most brilliant Renaissance and English masters in the world, but on the other hand, wrote children's stories. But listen to this. The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We're told to deny ourselves and take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ, and to nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do contains an appeal to desire. If there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and to earnestly hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has crept in from Kant and the Stoics and has no part in the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Mm -hmm. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. Mm -hmm. We are far too easily pleased. Wow. Mm -hmm. Clarity of thought, right? Able to bring uh, uh, kind, of, kind of this uh, analogy uh, of the young child pleased with making a mud pie when he's just been offered a holiday at the, at the ocean, I mean, he can't imagine that, so he settles for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clarity of thought. I love Madeline L'Engle. Anybody here read her? Yeah, Madeline L'Engle, Wind at the Door. Um, fantastic uh, fantasy. Uh, almost like, you know, the precursor to science fiction, but this woman writes from a deep Christian faith, and in here, she begins to describe... Um, what we, we know as cherubim, these heavenly beings. And in this uh, particular part of the story, she introduces us to a cherubim as it presents itself to a, the character, a young boy who's sick, named Charles Wallace. Uh, and so let me just read briefly here. Charles Wallace's drive of dragons was a single creature, actually. Although Meg was not at all surprised that Charles Wallet had confused the fierce wild being with dragons. She had the feeling that she never saw all of it at once, and, and, which, uh, and which of all the eyes could she meet? Merry eyes, wise eyes, ferocious eyes, kitten eyes, dragon eyes, opening and closing, looking at her, looking at Charles Wallace and Calvin and the strange tall man, and wings, wings in constant motion, covering and uncovering the eyes, 
When the wings were spread out, they had a span of at least 10 feet. And then when they were all folded in, the creature resembled a mystery, a misty, feathery sphere. Little spurts of flame and smoke spouted up between the wings. It would certainly start a grass fire if it weren't careful. Meg did not wonder that Charles Wallace had not approached it. Again, this tall stranger reassured them, he won't hurt you. The stranger was dark, dark as night and tall as a tree. And there was something in that repose of his body and the quiet of his voice which drove away fear. Charles Wallace stepped toward him. Who are you? A teacher. Charles Wallace sighed, was longing. I wish you were my teacher. I am. The cello-like voice was calm and slightly amused. You know, this is dreamt up from imagination, from, from kind of um, biblical images that are only hinted at in the scriptures. And, and as an author, she lets that inspire her imagination. Right? She's not trying to make an accurate description of what the Bible says about cherubim. She's using that as a platform, and that's what writers do. Writers take inspiration, and they believe that you, the filter of your eyes and the filter of your life is going to put something forward that's original, and that's worthy, and that's going to be in some way consoling or helpful. Or let me introduce you to one of my favorite writers, maybe my favorite writer, American writer, Annie Dillard. Annie Dillard was the, uh, the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for her, her um, biography, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And uh, I love her for her irony. That's one of the things Annie Dillard does really well. Um, she says, make sure I'm on the right page here. Well, ah, wrong book. <laughs> there we go. All right. Why do we people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute? The tourists are having coffee and donuts on deck C. Presumably someone is minding the ship, correcting the course, avoiding the icebergs and shoals, fueling the engines, watching the radar screen, noting weather reports radioed in from shore. No one would dream of asking the tourists to do these things. Alas, among the tourists on deck sea, drinking coffee and eating donuts, we find the captain and all the ship's officers and all the ship's crew. The officers chat, they swear, they wink a bit. At slightly raw jokes, just like regular people, the crew members have funny accents, the wind seems to be picking up. On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke when we pray? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. <laughs> it is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. <laughs> Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, on, or, or waking God may draw us out to where we can <coughs> never return. I mean, I will never forget the image of her saying, you know what, when we go to church, we should be wearing crash helmets. Because this is serious stuff coming before the Holy God, right? I'll never forget that, that image. And she writes with that sense of holy irony. Susan Howitch is another one of my favorite authors, and I won't take time to read you a quote, but if you want a series that will help you understand what good writing is, Susan Howitch is... Um, series called the Starbridge series, and a second series called the St. Bennett's series. Um, this is the later Susan Howitch. The earlier stuff is more like a romance novel. I don't care for it. The later stuff is out of this world, off the charts, good dialogue. And her dialogue is what's really uh, strong. I love Gerard Manley Hopkins for his sensitive, thoughtful, uh, poetic verse. He has very unusual rhythms. Gerard Manley Hopkins was, he lived around 1877, and he was a priest. He often visited very lonely places. 
Um, he was a poet at heart, more poet than priest, really. Let me uh, read you one poem of his. Um, he comes upon a young girl standing outside her cabin door, and she's looking at this golden grove of trees, and it's fall, and so the, the leaves are coming down. And they're all on the, on the ground, and she has this most forlorn look on her face. And he catches her in that kind of moment. She doesn't know he's observing. Um, and he watches her face. Here's his poem. Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? Unleaving, the, the leaves, leave it, leaving the tree. Leaves like the things of man you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? Ah, as the heart grows older, it will come to such sights colder. By and by, nor spare a sigh, though worlds of wanwood leaf meal lie. And yet you will weep and know why. No, now no matter, child, the name, sorrows, springs are the same, nor mouth had, nor no, nor mind expressed. What heart heard of, ghost guessed, is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret that you mourn for. Hmm. What's he saying here? He's saying this young girl uh, is catching this pensive moment and she's grieving the fact that these beautiful leaves won't be on the trees anymore. And she said, and he's saying, you feel bad for that. Get used to that, Margaret, because that's what happens in life. Things change, we decay. Yeah. And in fact, right now, you are decaying. You're growing older, and in fact, you're not just grieving for the leaves you see falling. You're actually grieving for yourself. That's that human part of you that knows that we are um, temporary. Mm. Okay, so what does the poet do? The poet captures that message in the look of a girl, mm. right? And he doesn't explain it to you like yeah. I just explained it to you. Good writing doesn't just spell it out. Good writing inspires us to get into the feeling of that. That part that we, 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 we understand with our heart, but not necessarily with our mind. Good writing gets us into something that can't be expressed mm -hmm. just by the clarity of the thought. Y'all are interested in writing technical manuals on how to put your counter together that you just bought at <laughs> Ikea or at Walmart. I assume that's not why you're coming to writing, right? You want to do something that captures something that only language put in a certain way can do. And, and yeah. whether that's prose, whether that's poetry, uh, even the works of Lewis has a certain poetic cadence about it, even though he's just writing, he's writing pro prose, not fiction necessarily, where I just really uh, shared with you. Dorothy Sayers. I just love Dorothy Sayers for her love of language. I love her description. Um, in fact, if you want to know what my favorite novel is in the world, it's this one, Gaudy Night by Dorothy Sayers. Now, in this case, Gaudy Night, um, Sayers is, the, the story is about uh, a detective writer, which is interesting because Sayers was a detective writer. So many people see this is really autobiographical. Sayers was educated in Oxford. This writer that's depicted in the story is educated in Oxford. And Oxford is a very special city to me. I spent a year there, finished a degree there, I was on sabbatical, it was an amazing time in my life. In this case, this mystery writer was falsely accused of a murder. Hmm. And in the previous book to this one, she was exonerated, okay? So now in this book, she's trying to put her life back together. and. Um, at her old college in Oxford, uh, there's been a series of really dangerous things happening, and they can't figure out who's doing them. Threats being made. And so they ask her to come back and just pretend to be there to study something and just keep her eyes open. Right? And so she's been doing this for about halfway through the book right now. And finally, she's able to just get back to uh, her room. And she's, she's describing what her days are like now that she's kind of back in the college rhythm. 
Listen to this. Mornings in the Bodley. That's the library there. Drowsing among the worn browns and tarnished gilding of Duke Humphrey, snuffing the faint musty odor of slowly perishing leather, hearing only the discreet tippity tap of a gog feed on the padded floor, taking afternoons, long afternoons, taking an outrigger up the Charwell River, feeling the rough kiss of the oars on the unaccustomed palms, listening to the rhythmical and satisfying kerplunk of the rowlocks, <laughs> watching the play of muscle on the bursar's sturdy sh shoulders at stroke as the sharp spring wind flattened the thin silk shirt against them, or if the day were warmer, flicking swiftly in a canoe under the modelum walls, and so by the twisting race at King's Mill by Mesopotamia to Parson's pleasure and then back, with mind relaxed and body stretched and vigorous, to make toast by the fire and then at night the lit lamp and the drawn curtain with the flutter of the turned page and soft scrape of pen on paper, hmm. the only sounds to break the utter silence between quarter and quarter chime. Now and again, Harriet took out the dossier of the poison pen letters and looked it over. Yet viewed by that solitary lamp, even the ugly printed scrawls looked harmless and impersonal, and the whole dismal problem less important than the determining of a first edition date or the settlement of a disputed reading. In that melodious silence, something came back to her that had lain dumb and dead over, ever since the, the old, innocent undergraduate days. The singing voice, stifled long ago by the pressure of the struggle for existence and throttled into dumbness by that queer, unhappy contact with physical passion, began to stammer a few uncertain notes. Great golden phrases rising from nothing and leading to nothing swam up out of her dreaming mind like the huge sluggish carp in the cool waters. She goes on to, to write a poem in that moment. <clears throat> what, you're, what you're seeing here is a writer who's shut the world out, drawn the curtains in her room, I'll never forget reading these words literally in a room near the college where she was describing in Oxford, listening to the rain outside, getting my own piece of paper out and writing something and listening to the scrape of my pen hmm. on that paper. Um, something true and beautiful in that moment. Here Dorothy Sayers is talking about the creative process and something that we ought to long for and, and make space for. Uh, in our lives as well. Well, those are just a few, and I probably should stop there. I mean, G.K. Chesterton and yeah, Chesterton yeah. is another one, and yeah, he's, great. he's known for his great wit. Um, let me just share two. He says, the word good has many <coughs> meanings. For example, if a man were to shoot his grandmother at a range of 500 yards, I would call him a good shot, but not necessarily a good man. <laughs> or he says, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting, it has been found difficult and not tried. Now this is someone who puts his feet up at a desk and looks at something from different angles. And wit, I mean, he, he's known primarily in the world for his wit. That's Chesterton's gift. It may not be your gift, it may not be my gift, but it was Chesterton's. So therefore, mm -hmm. everything he came to tried to access the wit, mm -hmm. the surprise, the turn of phrase. And what he reminds me to do when I'm sitting down to write is to be myself, mm -hmm. to figure out who I am and what I have to contribute. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about that more. Why do I share all these authors with you? Why do we start a writing workshop by, by sharing all these authors with you? Because good writers read. Mm -hmm. That's just the end of it right there. Good writers read. And if you're not making time to read in your life, um, it's a grave mistake. And it will negatively impact any attempt you make at writing. Mm. writing anything that has something worth reading to others. Mm. You must read. If your literary life is shallow, you will be shallow. Mm. Good writers familiarize themselves with the great writers through history. They learn from them what they like, what they don't like, from their stories and from their styles. 
And you know what that's called? It's called humility. You realize you're part of, you know, a, a grand, long story mm -hmm. where God has been inspiring his people for thousands of years to the brightest and the best. Mm. And if we're going to, here we are showing up in Fresno, California, and thinking that the world ought to love everything we do <coughs> because it's me, um, we need more humility than that. We need to know where we've come from. <clears throat> to have anything to say to where we ought to be going. If you can't tell me where we've come from, where literature has come from, you think you're going to contribute something unique and appropriate for the future? You have to have a sense of the shoulders that you're standing on. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care if your, your genre is uh, rap music, or spoken word poetry, or... Uh, poetic prose or, or classic poetry, you know, the genre isn't as important. Know, your, know the history of the genre that you feel most drawn to. Mm -hmm. That is important. That's it's good. true across every genre. Mm -hmm. Let me read you one more from Annie Dillard. And this answers the question, why are we reading? She says this, why are we reading if not in the hope of beauty laid bare? Life heightened and its deepest mystery probed? Can the writer isolate and vivify all an experience that most deeply engages our intellects and our hearts? Can the writer renew our hope for literary forms? Why are we reading if not in hope that the writer will magnify and dramatize our days? Will illuminate and inspire us with wisdom courage, and the possibility of mean, meaningfulness, and will press upon our minds the deepest mysteries so that we may feel again their majesty and the power. What do we ever know that's higher than that power, which from time to time seizes our lives and reveals us startlingly to, our, startlingly to ourselves <clears throat> as creatures set down here, bewildered? Why does death so catch us by surprise, and why love? We still and always want waking. We should amass half-dressed in long lines like tribesmen and shake gourds at each other to wake up. Instead, we watch television and miss the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's wow. why we read. Wow. It's really to become more human and more divine. It's, we read, wow. C.S. Lewis said, we read to know that we're not alone. We join that great company of people who are awake. <clears throat> that's why we read. And I think that's really only, the only reason why we should write. Mm. So we should wake each other up. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> wow. Shake us out of our sleep. We get lulled to sleep by the banality that's offered to us that's in this good. world. That's good. Wow. Well, let me stop there. And uh, let me just ask you, I've shared some of my favorite authors with you. Can I hear from you? Who are some of your favorite authors? Well, I share C.S. Lewis. I really like him. I read Chesterton. I like his Father Brown series. I like Dickens. I like Austin. Believe it or not, I read Austin. Jane Austen. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, Jane Austen. Yep, I've read some of her works. So, good writer. You know, it's not my genre, but, you know, she's a good writer and I'll give um, and then there's uh, yeah, uh, there's one other and it just escapes me. But yeah, those are those are the area you know, guys I really like. Can also, I ask you to reflect on that a little bit? Why? What do you think it is about that list that you shared mm -hmm. that appeals to you from from each of those? Uh, is I, there a common thread between them? Well, what I try to find, or what I've gone when I've when I've looked at writing, I try to find. You know the the word classic, mm -hmm. kind of like the apex, the best. Sure. The, Finest examples of different genres. Yeah, yeah. And Dickens, Austin, Austin speaks of one part. Of, I I try to see who describes human nature. Well, Dickens did his part. Austin did her part. Right. Um, I mean, there are different areas of human nature. Okay. So human nature is human so, nature is what you're fascinated yeah, by. That. Yes. And they bring out human nature. Yes. Yeah. That's excellent. Someone else. What's your favorite author? 
Uh, one of mine is um, Priscilla Shire. She actually just, um, I mean, she's like, she's a speaker, um, preacher, but she writes really, really good <coughs> Bible study uh, series curriculum. Um, and I just really connect with her, with her story. Um, she's African American. She's a woman, so I'm just like, I yeah, need there, a model. There yeah. are a million Bible studies out there. Exactly. Right? Why her? Why yeah, her? What is it exactly. about her that yeah. connects with you? Yeah, yeah. She just, um, she's the daughter of Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans, and um, so just her theological foundation is just so strong. Um, and it's like, like reading her Bible studies are literally like sitting at the table with they're just chatting and I like to chat okay. <laughs> so she's like it's her, just her like style's her style very conversational okay. that's good very like even her her videos her DVDs that she does like okay pause there because I know you want to talk about it all right you know okay. so yeah so conversational good. tone all right someone else who, who are your favorite authors yeah um, I think Lissette. two yeah sorry okay. two um, off the top of my head it would be Robert Jordan or Scott Card. Mostly because Orson Scott Card was more sci-fi, the Ender series, and Robert Jordan was more fantasy, and that just blew my mind at that age. <laughs> this is possible, like this imagination, the things that you can kind of create. Like, okay. The ability that God has given you to just make these completely different worlds from awesome. what you're used to was just like. Yeah. Yeah, you put it really well. You're, you're connecting with this idea that God has made us co-creators in, in, in a way. He's, we're made in His image, and He is a creator. Yeah. You can create these worlds, and these authors have really tapped into that, and there's something about that that mm -hmm. feeds you. Yeah, that's a good example. What else? I have a, a, a like, I was trying to think, but I have a thing how you said, you know, like what category? I have several different categories. Right. <laughs> like, um, I like, Maya Angelou was one of the first that I was really attracted to uh, in high school. Yeah. A mm -hmm. teacher gave us the book and we read it and I loved, um, it was um, Why the Cage Birds Sings. Why the Cage Birds And so it was a story of yeah. her life and I could relate to it in a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, being biracial, it kind of helped me to relate to a side of me that I really wasn't right. exposed mm -hmm. to as much right, right. because I was more with the Mexican side of my family. Sure. So that was like, cool, you know, and so that was kind of cool for mm -hmm. me. And then um, once I got into college, I started to read Alice Walker right. mm -hmm. and I really liked her and I liked some of the poetry that she wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, just throughout my Christian journey, it's kind of changed. Like I love Beth Moore because mm -hmm. I like how she um, use the scripture a lot and I don't know it's just like so she's teaching and I love that I love to like kind of dig and learn mm -hmm. and um, and then recently I started reading I'm um, Henry Nowen okay. and so I, I love his writing good spiritual writings and developing the inner life mm -hmm. as well you said I could relate to her talking about um, Maya Angelou and that that's very close to I think what Lewis was talking about when he mm -hmm. said what we read to know that we're not alone yeah uh, because I think we all go through life with this great doubt mm -hmm. am I strange am I <laughs> unlike everyone else am I do I fit in um, was I a mistake I mean these are the essential questions of existence <clears throat> and mm -hmm. this finding a company of people out there that we resonate with uh, or who can understand my special journey uh, uh, that have a connection to that. It's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? I really like uh, Anne Lamont. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my recent favorite book was uh, by Father Greg Boyle. Um, and also, I was going to say Henry Nolan. Yeah, yeah, those are. Um, I, I, I think I love that. Um, the really vivid snapshots of like humanity and life um, with a with a, a summary of like, the values of humanity. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. That's not a great explanation, but... <coughs> well, with Greg Boyle, like my, um, the, the tattoos on the heart, is that one of the ones yeah. you're talking about? Mm -hmm. um, his story, I, I don't think I've ever read a book where I actually sheds here on the page on almost every page and i think the story itself becomes the message doesn't it it merges somehow with that message and validates the message in a way that um, a more abstract academic approach to the subject might not yeah well when we're asking who are your favorite authors 
I ask that not as a discussion starter, but as an introduction to this idea that your life is a lens. And through that lens, God's going to shine his light. And it's going to look really different than other lenses. But you have a, a company of people out there in the world that you resonate with. Because God has moved them in similar ways. And we can learn from each other. And so, you know, you're reading a lot of different people. Some hit, some don't hit. And when you resonate with someone, this is my invitation to you to pay attention and ask yourself the question, why? Why is this really resonating with me? And that's going to give you a clue as to which direction to pursue in your writing. Because really, we're really, um, it, it, it does not make sense to pursue writing in areas that don't resonate. That's just doing something for money, otherwise known as prostitution, <laughs> when you think about it. Right? It's betraying that creative impulse. Now, we've all got to do things we don't like. I mean, every job has a percentage of things you just got to do because it comes with the territory, right? Right. But when I'm talking about this creative part of our life, there's a reason God has given you a certain impulse, and it's a combination of your mind and of the experiences that God has given you in your life. And no one else has that particular combination of life or mind and experience. So you've got to ask the question, why that combination? And when you read someone and you resonate with them, that's a clue about your unique combination of mind and experience. Am I making myself clear on that one? So pay attention to the reason you like something. See if you can identify. It's not enough to say, oh, I, just, I just like it. I don't know, I just like it. It's not going to help you if you leave it there. If you like something, figure it out. Why do you like that? What is it about that that's resonating with you? Because I'm telling you, it's connecting with something in your core. It's, it's, it's intersecting that mind experience continuum. It's intersecting that. Pay attention to that. So sometimes, like the Annie Dillard thing, I love that quote about the crash helmet. Sometimes the writer is putting something into words that is deep inside of you and you never had words for it. Yeah. And then you get to read it and you're like, oh my gosh. That's it. exactly That's right. It. So it, it lights you up because mm -hmm. you already have had a thread of that thought. So yeah. true. And that's the beauty of this particular mm -hmm. lens that every life represents. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else could have said it like that. Mm -hmm. like, there needed to be an Annie Dillard in yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that she comes up with this phrase about going to church with a crash helmet on. Because you don't know what God's going to do there. Yeah. Right? So that's why it's so important for us to pay attention with what resonates. It gets that's us in the ballpark of this particular call that, that God has, has given. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, Kathy. Because I, the only time in my life I ever saw my father cry was when he was reading poetry. Mm -hmm. The only time. Hmm. And it was because the poet was saying something that he had felt, wow. but had no words for. It. Wow. <laughs> so really, really important. My own writing journey. Uh, I'll just say a few words about that before we turn to the practical stuff. Um, I wrote Journey to the Center of the City because I had to have a way of processing what my family was going through when we moved to the Lowell neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there was gunfire every night, and we had to hit the floor a few times because bullets were flying. We were meeting people every day. They were coming to our door with needs. We were meeting kids and taking them home and seeing drugs come down on the couch. And it was so overwhelming. There was no other way that, other for me than to write, to process. And as I began to do that, I began to realize, you know what? God called me to do this. He's calling other people to do this, and maybe they would like to hear some of the stuff we're going through. So it was that desire um, to, to, to share as well. Encounter God in the City was a book that I wrote after a few years in the neighborhood where I began to see the forces that were shaping life here. And these were forces that weren't being talked about. Mm. It was pluralism. It was racism. It was materialism. It was 
even the force of innocence. And so this was a chance to talk about these forces that I saw in the lives of kids, especially, and adults. And so my processing, again, led to a chance to um, share that uh, with, with other people. This book was, I think, more along the artistic lines. Um, I had a friend, really my, my best buddy in the world um, at the time, named Scott Besnecker. He was the director of global projects with InterVarsity. And I was in a meeting with him in Madison, Wisconsin. And <clears throat> suddenly a part of his body stopped working, and we realized he's having a stroke. Mm -hmm. A young man, and uh, in, his t in his early 40s at the time. <clears throat> 40s? No, late 40s. Late 40s at the time. So uh, we took him to the hospital, and um, he started to regain some of his faculties. And Scott's a really funny guy. He, you know, he's laying there in the gurney in the room, and the nurse hooks the electrocardiogram, no, electroencephalogram, up to his head, his skull, so they read his brain waves and all that kind of shit. And then she flips the switch on him, and Scott, you know, he was fully conscious at the time, and he just kind of faked electric, elect electrocution. <laughs> and he sent that nurse jumping to the ceiling, and she practically hit him, you know. Was, you know. Um, but Scott, Scott did it to inject a little humor in, because his wife was there, she's all worried and everything. Well, I flew home promising to pray for Scott. Hmm. But Scott was my best friend in the world. And I told him, I you know, Scott, I'll be praying for you this whole year. I mean, I'm going to pray for you for a year. God completely restores you. And on the plane on the way home, I thought, what does that mean? I mean, am I going to say to God every day for you, God, please heal Scott. God, he's, please heal Scott. God, please heal Scott. God, please heal Scott. Hmm. How much did that require for me to do? Hmm. Nothing. Hmm. So, I, I, as I thought about that, I thought, what if, what if, I express something closer to the heart, mm. from the language of the heart. Mm. Um, every week for a year. Mm. And what if by every Thursday I had a poetic prayer mm. that I would send to Scott. He'd get it in his email box every Thursday for 52 weeks. Mm -hmm. Didn't know if I could do it. It's like writing a poem a week. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't a poem. It was poetic intercession, mm. poetic prayer. So I did. I started doing it. And after a while, Scott wrote back and he said, Randy, I hope you're collecting these because mm -hmm. other people could pray these too. Mm -hmm. So I happened to have a sabbatical that year and I went back to Oxford and I spent all my time in the Bodleian Library and looking up this idea of poetic intercession. Was this a known form of prayer? Mm -hmm. And there were some examples of it out there. Um, let me read you one that I wrote to Scott. This is called Potter God. Mm. Potter God, who whirled the wheel with your left foot that spun the table with the lump of Scott on top, mm. who smoothed the edges with your palms gliding upward and thinned the sides with the arc of your hand as he rose in height and took form. My friend Scott, oozing through your fingers as mm. you pressed. My friend Scott, collapsing and buckling at points, being remade according to your fancy. Potter God, who left your swirling fingerprints in the softness, made them permanent in the firing, who left the true marks of his maker, who chose no glaze, none needed to display your craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Potter God, who lets this vessel be used in this careless world, mm -hmm. not protected in glass on some celestial shelf to be admired, but filled and placed precariously where he is jostled, chipped and cracked, worn and weathered. Potter God, you who molded, molded and fashioned Scott, repair and strengthen him now. Mm. So the surpassing greatness of what fills him, the treasure of Christ, may be displayed. Mm. That was free verse. And every week I tried a different form. So yeah. some weeks it was haiku, some weeks it was sonnet, some weeks it was a, 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 an ancient form of a poem called triolet, which I had never heard of before. But here's a triolet. May Scott run only for you. In his long stride, feel your pleasure. 
Feel his call and strength renewed. May Scott run only for you. Use his gifts, both known and new. Set his sights on lasting treasure. May my friend run only for you. In his long stride, feel your pleasure. So for me, making that commitment was a choice to learn and then to use these forms that I was learning as a conduit for prayer. Yeah. It's, it's why it's called poetic prayer. And that's why the subtitle is Artful Prayers for a Friend. Because it wasn't enough that I was just going to pray for my friend. There had to be some of me put into the praying. Yeah. Otherwise, it just didn't mean much. Yeah. You know, so we, all, we all say, yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And then we walk away and we forget, don't we? Mm -hmm. Half the time, when we say, I'll pray for you, we walk away and we forget. But there was no way I was forgetting <laughs> these poems, these prayers that I labored. And one, one time, there's a poem in here, I won't take time to read it, but one time, it was 11.53 on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I got in bed, I collapsed, it was an exhausting week. Mm -hmm. At 11.53, I realized, oh my gosh, I forgot to write a poem, a poetic prayer for Scott. Mm. And I raced downstairs and I said, God help me. <laughs> and in the last seven minutes of that day, we wrote a poetic prayer for Scott. Wow. And the last line of that, that prayer was, God, make him sleep in. Mm. Past his alarm, make him wake up at seven. Because I had it was a play on the word seven. Because I only had seven minutes to mm. write the prayer. The next day, Scott called me back, and he said, "You won't believe this, Randy, but I slept through my alarm this morning." <laughs> and then I went to the email and I got your poetical uh, wow. <laughs> So it was fun to see, that, to see that process. The work of our hands grew out of Mayor Swearingen coming to the No Name Fellowship saying. Hey, what could the church do to bring their talents to the issue of unemployment in our city? Okay, so what have I just shared with you here? Um, Very good. These books grew out of experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This book grew out of a crisis and an, uh, a heartfelt response. This book grew out of an external request. <coughs> We came in and said, what, what could we do? And so we did a year's worth of research, uh, a team of us. This is, I, I'm the editor, but I'm not the author of the whole book. I, I brought the team together and worked for a year on that. So all of these stimuli will happen in our lives as writers, all of them. And you don't know where the necessity of or the inspiration for your writing will come from. Um, and we're going to talk about this more in just a minute here, but if we're not writing every day, we're really not in a posture that can receive those, mm -hmm. those inspirations. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. Okay. Um, I guess I'll mention I'm currently writing a novel. This is it. <laughs> and um, Wow. Yeah, I, it's First draft is done, but I, I imagine by the time the second draft um, is done, it'll actually be a little longer. Um, wow. There's a little bit more development that, that needs to happen. Um, but it's taken several years. I started this when I was traipsing around the world working for Baki Graduate University and seeing amazing things that I just didn't want to convey through a regular nonfiction. I thought, actually, fiction is going to be the best vehicle for this. Mm. So, um, I find it, those who are serious about writing are always asking about the genre that they should write in. They should always ask, what's the best vehicle for conveying the truth that mm -hmm. I'm hoping to convey? Why did Jesus te tell parables? Mm -hmm. Parables are fiction, folks. Parables are fiction. They didn't happen. He made it up. Why did he make it up? Because he felt at that point that a story was the right vehicle. Now that's what we do when we write fiction. Just because it's fiction doesn't mean it's not true. Mm -hmm. It is true. Mm -hmm. And fiction is the best vehicle to convey that truth. 
So again, being in touch with the, the truth that is bubbling up in our life, we have to ask the question, what's the, the right uh, vehicle for that? Okay, so let me, um, let, me, let me just share briefly before I break this up again uh, and talk about the, 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 the essence of what I think we're trying to say when we write something. For me, I was trying to figure out what I thought in, in, our, in my writing about our mission in some cases of those books or about circumstances or about life and God. When I was writing these poetic prayers, I was wrestling with my own theology as well. What do I believe about healing, for example? Mm. Mm. God, can you heal him? What about the people that don't get healed? Mm. And trying to express and listen on Scott's behalf mm. um, rather than just praying my own questions because mm. I'm trying to pray something that's helpful for him, what God is doing in his life. So, but this idea of trying to figure things out, this is one of the core reasons why many writers write and it's a perfectly legitimate for why you should write. Secondly, I was trying to widen the circle of people who could go on kind of a short length of my journey with me. Writing can be a very solitary activity and uh, it, the, the image of a writer sequestered in a little room by themselves or writing in a coffee shop, you know, with the buzz of conversation around but really on their own table, <coughs> Those are romantic images, but <laughs> writers need human interaction. Writers need uh, to be part of a community. Mm. And to, so to knit yourself together with others and take them on a portion of your journey with you, that's ultimately what we're doing in our writing. We're including others. I didn't want, in the case of this novel, this novel is about a man who thought his life was about one thing, but through a crisis, found that he had not discovered his true self yet. Mm. That's what this novel is about. He thought his life was about one thing, mm. but through a crisis discovered he had not yet discovered his true self. Now, how did he do that? He was traipsing around the world. Mm. Well, I was kind of traipsing around the world. There's a little bit of me in this book, right? Yeah. So uh, he was seeing things in his, he was a, the, the main character is a, uh, uh, he, he makes micro loans to um, uh, worthy agencies around the world that are working in squatter settlements, basically. Mm. Well, I happen to be traipsing to a lot of those squatter <laughs> settlements, right? So what was I trying to do? I was trying to capture stuff that none of my friends in Fresno, California yeah. would ever see. Yeah. What a weird privilege I had to mm. traipse around the world and see these mm. amazing and strange things to have these conversations with people that no one else would be privy to, mm. right? To interview women who, who were working in a brothel, to wind through the dangerous pathways of a, of a slum in Manila. Mm. Like, these are things that most people I know in my sphere would not be exposed to. What was I trying to do? I said, I'm trying to take people with me. Mm. Why? Because I don't want that stuff to be wasted. Yeah. Yeah. My gosh, if I'm the only one that got to see those things, mm. I think that's a waste. Mm. I want to take people with me. And so that's is good. there something about your journey wow. that's unique that's that, frankly, most people just aren't going to know or see, and you want to take them with you mm. so that those lessons you're learning aren't wasted, so that there's an afterlife to these these lessons. That's, that's, that's the good. important thing. Mm. Um, I want, wanted there to be a point to my journey, something that could be helpful, or at least an enjoyment to someone else. Uh, C.S. Lewis used to say, you know there's an impulse that's in every human being, let's say you're driving on a mountain road, and it's beautiful, it's late, late afternoon, early evening, and you round the a mountain pass, and suddenly there's this unbelievably glorious sunset, right? <clears throat> What's your first impulse? You want to tell somebody, you turn, even though there's no one sitting next yeah. to you in your car. Yeah. You want to turn, you know, there's no one there. Yeah. I mean, do you see that? You yeah. want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. that your enjoyment is not complete mm. until you've said, did you see that? Because you want someone else to see it too. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to validate the fact that, wow, I really saw that. Huh. That's how we're wired. And that's why we write. Because we want to say to other people, did you see that? Did you know that? 
Can you experience that like I'm experiencing that? I was creating, and we're all meant for this. We're made in the image of the one who's called creator. Okay, so we're about halfway through, and now I want to ask you, why are you here? I asked you earlier who your favorite authors were and what, what it was that you liked about those authors. But I think it's rather unique that a church is putting a writing workshop on. And I want to know, why are you here? What are you interested in learning or doing? Or Let's just go around the room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you, Beth, and we're going to just go around that way. Why are you here? Um... I'm here. I was an English major and I love reading and writing. And um, I'm here because recently I had someone in my life say, um, you used to blog and you haven't blogged for like a couple of years. And I really enjoy reading your writings. And I was kind of um, taken aback because uh, first of all, I didn't think anyone read my blog. <laughs> um, but then it um, triggered something in me that was like, I love, I love writing. I, I love trying to find a way to put into um, words and experience, and um, and help others enjoy, re you know, reading that and um, creative you know, uh, descriptive language. And so, anyway, then I saw a writer's workshop and I thought I should, I should think about that. I have an upcoming sabbatical and I'm thinking about mm. doing a writing project. Wow. Mm -hmm. it? That's awesome. You know, I lived your life for a while. I love it. And um, the director of an institute. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it just takes so much to keep the wheels turning on that thing. That the things that I ended up writing there's a great temptation just to make them purely functional. Mm. This is what we did. These are the pictures. Mm. I'll put in the prayer letter. These are the captions. All right. Purely functional. Because to do something of higher quality takes a lot more time. Energy. Energy. And um, it's interesting to me that someone said to you, I used to read your blog. Why? Mm. People don't read stuff that um, isn't any good. Yeah. They, they just don't anymore. Mm. That's an amazing clue that there's mm. something there That's good. and it's worth really fanning into flame. Uh, mm. Because we're filled with so much stuff coming through our our social media and yeah. um, I mean it, it, it's pretty tough to filter through it all to get to something really good. Mm. And when you find that, people read it. I'm really glad that you're, you're doing that. I've mm. forgotten your name. My name's Nina. Nina, that's your name. Nice to see you. Yeah. And I'm here because um, I've had several words over the years about just um, needing to write my story. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that part of it is questioning why, what for, what, what's the reason. And um, <coughs> God's brought me through a lot and a lot of different things. Um, I'm a musician, first and foremost. So <coughs> I think um, some of my favorite writers are actually musicians. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but I have, there's so many that I, I, there's just a lot. So I think when I was thinking about what is it that it, it's really, it's, you know, I think about folk music is one of my favorite, like, and, you know, later folk music, but it's really the stories of the people. Mm -hmm. And it's really about hardships and life and and what we all, and is that connected <coughs> to others, like, oh, I'm not alone, oh, I, 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 that's, that's me, that's you, that's all of us, and we're yes. in this together. And I think that's really primary, primarily why I think about writing and sharing my story and really it's my story but it's really God's story of redemption and mm. the fact that I'm still here and yeah. I'm sane and all yeah. kind of yeah. and all of those things yeah. put yeah. together and I think that sharing that um, that redemptive <coughs> thing but I, I still don't know exactly what, mm. how to put it all together. <coughs> Gotcha. Yeah, so that's it, really. That's awesome. Mm. Thank you. Is that? Um, I'm here mostly to better own my writing. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of amazing opportunities these past few months going through on ramps. Mm -hmm. um, they're so kind to let me do some writing on their blog. <laughs> um, so just, I don't know. Um, I started writing <coughs> maybe a few years ago, and then it just felt right. Mm -hmm. It felt like, oh. This makes me feel alive. 
this, mm. I feel like this is what I was created for. Mm. And did it for a while and then stopped. So now I want to pick it up again and stop using the excuse of I'm just busy. Because mm. that it's it's the way that I feel mostly connected with God but also with other people. Yeah. Mm. It's good. And writing is such work, which we'll talk about in a minute, that there's there's the craft part of it that isn't necessarily the fun part of it. Yeah. Um, but there are some ways that we can approach that that help get past the busyness. So thank you. Lisa? Um, why am I here? Well, actually, to be honest with you, I'm here to get over my fear. Mm-hmm. Because um, I fell in love with writing at a very young age. I've always journaled, and I've always... Um, kept a diary of some sort and um, in my relationship with Christ I bought a prayer journal and it's always the way that I feel the most connected to you mm-hmm. and so when I write I find myself writing what he's saying to me mm-hmm. yeah. and so I can go back and reread it yeah. and um, when I'm in church that's my way of worshiping if you ever see me somewhere you'll notice that you know I always felt weird because people would be up you know and I yeah. might just be somewhere, name? like, <laughs> you know, just writing away. And somebody did come to me one day and said, why don't you just go ahead and write that book? Mm-hmm. And it brought tears to my eyes because I felt like I did need to share, but I've been afraid to share because my writing is so personal to me. Mm-hmm. Because writing for me really is a way of healing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so when I write, God is really talking to me about me and helping me heal. But I realized that that's not just for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That it's also... To help yep. others. Yeah. Writing is yeah. therapy. Yeah. Yeah. What's your name? Giovanni. Giovanni. Yes. Um, I have journaled and I, I do a lot of personal writing, uh, prayer as well. Um, sometimes the Lord can just wake me up in the middle of the night um, because I guess I don't listen during the day. <laughs> and so. Um, me too. And, and I just believe that um, I have a, well, we all have a story, um, but. I know that I have been so blessed by others writing, um, reading their books, and um, I enjoy uh, Beth Moore and some of the other writers that um, um, have been mentioned today. Mm-hmm. And so I would love to just um, gain additional skills in that area. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you, Esther. Welcome. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Why are you here? Um, well, I like some of these women here. Have um, I wrote a lot especially in high school, I have journals and journals and journals full. And um, it was my way to reflect, it was my way to tell my story, it was my way to vent, it was my way to <laughs> everything. And um, and then through college and being forced to write, um, that kind of put a damper on some of my writing. Sure. <laughs> and then, um, you know, life got kicked off after that and I've gotten busy. Mm-hmm. And um, and my mom enjoys writing, and um, we we always talk about writing our stories because yeah, mm-hmm. we have a story, but then there's lots of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's encouraged me as I've encouraged her. So it's always just kind of been a conversation of writing, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I feel like I can write better in a journal with a pen and a paper mm-hmm. than I can on the computer mm-hmm. sometimes. And then other times I'm. I'm stuck with a pen and paper and nothing kind of like I need I need a keyboard, you know. So it's just right. it's just an interesting thing. Yeah. But but mostly I write I write my stories or things that I'm that I'm noticing or going yeah. through or processing. Yeah. Writing as therapy in some ways. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, I think I'm here because writing has always been like the um, the one like genuine or like authentic thing about me, whereas I've always tried to make myself good at other things because of how other people perceive those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always tried to force myself to be good at all these other things when writing was naturally like um, what I was good at. And, um, what I truly liked, although I didn't want to really, like, really admit it. And then um, I think that like, cause I like writing like spoken word poetry and um, and like uh, like fiction and stuff. So I think that. Um, that has a lot. That has a lot to do with the fact that. Um, so I started writing like about a year ago, like and putting it out there to like um, people my age that follow me, like on Instagram and stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. and seeing kind of like their reaction to it. Um, 
because I, because like it's it's like I've got things in my mind that I'm like I feel like my generation is feeling and thinking about mm. but may not necessarily know exactly mm. you know how to how to put that in words or how to like um, to get that out there so I feel like being able to like connect um, with people like me and see if like they're saying they're thinking the same things and if mm. they're feeling the same things if yeah. they're questioning the same things mm -hmm. being part of a community of people who are processing those things together mm -hmm. becomes really valuable. It's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Well, I've always been a writer, so I say I'm a writer who doesn't write. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like you said, I, I've just been acknowledged as a good writer and, and did journalism. I thought I was going to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. and um, I'm not really sure what genre. I'm, I'm probably not a fictional writer. So, just wanted to get, you know, reconnected okay. with something that I love to do and I'm good at. Excellent. Yeah. Well, mine's been kind of a different journey. I want to, I'm here to find out how to get public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For a year, and my wife will attest to this, I, I would, I would, um, I don't like a lot of outside input, like when I go running or anything, I like my thoughts to go. Yeah. I would come back sometimes and I'd have entire stories. I'd say, hey, what do you think about this? And then mm -hmm. I would, sounds interesting, so I'd put it down, get the ideas. Finally, I think the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, do you know I'm giving you these things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is your imagination working. you got to put this down. And, I, and there's a purpose for why I'm, so I've got, you know, like Beth, what, what you were said about pen to paper, that's where my most creative, a scream, I do transfer, okay? Harry Potter was mostly written yellow pad. Yeah, she transferred it. That's how she did it. Yeah. So, um, so the Lord has given me, I mean, I got piles of notes and I got stacks of stuff and it's the next, it's the next jump to, and my daughter just prayed before we left, you know, and she's prayed for me before. Mm -hmm. Let dad get published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, and I try to, I try to write every day and I'm not, Always, I, I picked up, he's not my favorite author, but Phil Pullman, if you're familiar with him, his dark materials. Mm -hmm. he, he says, uh, I developed because I made the goal of writing three pages a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, just do the craft, you know, yeah. and some days I'm done, all done. Other days I just struggle, but I get the three days. Yeah. I can't do that every single day because sometimes yeah. I get to a point where I have to redo it. And, ah, I hate that, redo it. Sometimes I just go, I just hate the whole thing, turn it all off. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just uh, in fact, I told Kathy, I says, you know, I just hate this whole section that I just wrote. I just hate the thing. <laughs> then I come back and after a while, it's like, well, wow, this wasn't so bad. <laughs> so the whole thing about writing for me, it, it touches into the, into the spirit dimension. Yeah. It really does because you're going into a place really spiritually where the Lord deals with image, the Spirit speaking to you and through you, and then it's coming out into words, then you're transmitting it to other people. That's what it, that's what it's doing. And very, if it's done that way, it can be very effective, and you can really inspire people and you know, want to read things. And much like C.S. Lewis, you know, just came from the inner part. You know. That's good. Thank you. Be see. Well, I was originally here just for Lisette and KD. Um, they, they are great writers, and I thought, who better to learn from than Randy? So let's throw together a writer's workshop and get some, invite other folks, and here we are. So I was really here just investing in them. Um, and then I'm looking at my journal, and I realize I have about uh, 12, 13, 14 of these laying around the house and I realized that when I die there will be no question what was in Reese's mind. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to do with all that though so I just kinda like the ladies over here I, I like to write just to get it out to process to pray to receive and yeah so I'm not interested in publishing or anything like that I just I just like just good old journal and pen and just so all right. That's why I'm here. And, 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 and Mr. Phil, are you are you just running the camera back there? Or are you sweet? You here for a reason too. I, you know, I I think uh, I think a little of both. I think you know I, I am intrigued because I I think that for me I'm um, 
feel like I'm part of a generation and a community, both locally and, and, and kind of nationally, that I think we just need to keep uh, we need to keep a dialogue going. And I think that we are we are informing one another, we're shaping one another. Um, you know, and I and I think that um, yeah, I find that that uh, sometimes um, sometimes my voice I think is. Um, I'm just coming from a different perspective sometimes that I think has been helpful. People responded a lot too. So I'm just trying to figure out, uh, and like many of you have said, you know, I, so I've not, I'm not a writer. I don't, I don't journal. I don't, you know, doing that stuff. Um, you know, I, I think I've just written, you know, newsletters and grants and, <laughs> um, you know, and essays and research papers and all that stuff, but I don't like write, write. So, but I have all this stuff that I would, I would, I just feel like I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, the best medium to your point. So I wasn't yeah. thinking about genre as much. I think that's an important question that I t wrote down that I need to be thinking about. Yeah. But I'm trying to think medium because I'm like, man, is it, mm -hmm. should I be writing blogs? Right. Should I be, or a blog, that would be not proper terminology, I guess. But uh, <laughs> should I be writing a blog, uh, articles to be published, um, yeah. Books. I mean, what, you know, what what direction should I be going? So, so that's why I'm stuck. Yeah. Because I need to have, I need to know what I'm writing for before I write. Otherwise, I'm just. As a leader, what might God want you to capture? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is part of the experience of, of On Ramps Church, for example. Mm -hmm. Fairly unique place. Mm -hmm. Might there be things that you could capture in an artful way? Right. Might be a question that would emerge. So I want to get to this point. There are really only two reasons to write in the world. Uh, for you, for the fun of it, the art of it, the therapy of it, for the way that it untangles your own thoughts and clarifies things. So for you and for others. Uh, yeah. To express something true or beautiful that can move someone to tears or move someone to laughter or to reflection or to insight or to action. It moves them, in other words. Two reasons to write, for you or for others. Mm -hmm. And you have to experiment to see if your writing appeals to someone beyond you. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. You never know if you're writing just for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people just thought they were writing just for them. And it ends up being yeah. helpful yeah. to other people. Tina yeah. and I were in Amsterdam a couple weeks ago and we visited Anne Frank's house. Wow. You know, and I was supposed to have read the diary of Anne Frank when I was in high school, but I never did. <laughs> and so for the first time in my life, on the plane home, I devoured the diary of Anne Frank. Now, mm. that was a journal. She did have aspirations of turning it into a novel after her captivity mm. was over. But of course, she'd have to, you know, leave stuff out and change stuff and, yeah. and all of that. She was prepared to do it. But here was an insight, like mm -hmm. you say, Risi, that what she mm -hmm. left behind was an insight into her, mm -hmm. into her mind. And now the whole world mm -hmm. has read it, yeah. especially my generation, mm -hmm. read that book. And it said things. And it, it, it changed people's attitudes about the Holocaust and what it meant to be in captivity in World War II. And, uh, what life was like for Jewish people. You don't know what you're going to do that's going to affect others after your death. Do you know that most of the writers, most of the artists that I love most deeply in the world were not recognized until after they were dead? Mm -hmm. I hang out at uh, Van Gogh's museum. Van Gogh. You know, he the only person he ever sold a painting to was his brother. <laughs> His brother was an art dealer, and they had dreams of somehow, you know, painting a lot of paintings and, and creating shows and all of that. He only sold them to his brother. And he was unrecognized, really, as the genius that he really was until many, many years after he was dead. Hmm. George Herbert, no, sorry, not George Herbert, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who I read a poem to you earlier, was a priest, and early in his life as a priest, they discouraged him from writing. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. One of the greatest literary minds. Mm -hmm. They discouraged him from writing. Until later in his life, as a priest, they were, he was asked to actually write a poem. But he was, he was writing all the time. He just wasn't publishing. And therefore, he wasn't recognized until later. Would these things help anybody else? I gotta tell you, last month when I was reading Gerard Manley Hopkins, I was weeping. Because this 
man was capturing what I was going through. <clears throat> Weeping, some of his poems, as kingfishers catch fire. An amazing poem. Um, God's grandeur. Um, pied beauty. It's just poems I'm telling poem titles I'm giving you. Amazing. But he didn't know if anybody was going to read these and appreciate these. So your task of working as a writer begins with your belief that God has given you something to explore and you're just going to explore it, whether anybody reads it or not. Hmm. Your value as a writer has nothing to do with how marketable you are. Your hmm. value as a writer is to, is to let loose the voice that's inside you. Just do it. Just do it anyway. Even if nobody else thinks it's any good. That's now, good. the question will come at some point. Does anybody think this is any good? <laughs> it's a valid question to ask. It's okay to ask that question. And you really won't know until people start reading it. People ask you about it, or ask you back again, or ask you to write something else. You won't know. And, uh, that there's something there. Plus, you as a writer are growing. So if you want to develop this craft, I can tell you, you throw yourself into developing your craft, getting evaluated, then trying it again, then five years from now, your writing will be better than it was five years previously because you're going to work at it. We're not talking about the genius that, you know, Mozart knowing how to play piano at three years old here. That, those are very few people in the world. <laughs> Most beautiful and enduring things it took some work and it, it, it took evolution and they were better 10 years from now than they were 10 years ago yeah. so we have to commit to that that process okay let's talk about genres and formats a lot of you have said journals um, are important I brought a few of mine I have a stack of journals very tall because I've journaled ever since I began ministry hmm. um, 30 something years ago and let me talk about what a journal is and what a journal isn't. A journal isn't something you're writing for posterity. A journal isn't to give your children insight into their parents, into their, their moms or their, or their dad's thoughts. So in other words, you're not writing your journal thinking, oh, my son's going to read this someday. It's really not fair. If you want to tell your son something, you should tell that person something. You know, no, don't don't leave some bombs to explode <laughs> after you're dead and gone. It'll explain everything. Oh, it'll be all right then. You know, no. Um, the point of a journal is not to delay communication. The point of a journal is to reflect honestly on what you're going through. Now, I think journals have got to be more than just angst written, angst filled, you know, rages against God or wringing our hands spiritually or I think journals ought to be um, repositories of things that have been meaningful. And so here's another way to think about this. If you can't incorporate your reading and your art appreciation and your insights that come to you through conversation or quotes that you want to remember, if you can't integrate that into your, your regular journal or for some reason you don't want those in there, I really encourage you to keep a creative journal, a separate creative journal. And the creative journal is to write that quote from C.S. Lewis that, that you know Randy shared today that you really wanted to remember or from G.K. Chesterton. Or some phrase that your pastor shared that you just you know that's going to be important to you. You want to get it down. Or um, some insight that you had while standing and looking at a piece of art. These are the special things. These are not the daily things. In other words, your journal should not be like the diary of Anne Frank. She recorded daily things. And she recorded her thoughts about them. But this is not, this morning I got groceries at 9 o'clock, and, you know, it's not that. This is a creative journal that you know you only write the really good stuff in. This is something that allows you to have a repository. So, 
If that works for you, that's great. I don't choose to have a creative journal. I, I choose to make my regular journal full of those kinds of things. And that way I can put them side by side because I think when things come to you, ha has this been your experience? Sometimes things mean more to you because exactly of what, what you're going through. I'm ready to hear this quote now because of the stuff that I'm going through. So be ready. Yeah. Uh, be ready to have a, either a creative journal or a creative dimension uh, to your journal. You're going to write quotes and examples. You're going to write ways to capture and describe feelings before they vanish into the world of activities that dominate our life, right? Uh, ways to record or describe what you're seeing, perspective and viewpoint, and a place to experiment with metaphor and with simile. Now, metaphor and simile. What's a metaphor? Saying something, how can I best say it? Saying something that is like two unlike things, you're saying one thing is that, like yeah, he's a gorilla. Okay, good. His legs were stumps of oaks, right? Cut off at the knotted knees. Or it's, it's Mother Teresa saying, I am a little pencil in the hand of God. <laughs> That's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. A simile. Simile is, is, is saying something is like something else, not that, not that it is something. It's, it's her lips were like two slabs of granite pushed by a glacier. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's a simile. Right, why do we use these things? Because those images say something that words themselves wouldn't be able to say or it would take too long to say them. Have you ever had a perfunctory icy kiss from someone? <coughs> well, maybe, maybe that's what the author was trying to say right there. So, um, in your journal, because metaphor and simile are so crucial to creative writing, Pay particular attention to metaphors that really speak to you out there in the world or when you're reading other authors. And once again, like we started today, ask yourself, why does that mean something to me? Why does that particular metaphor speak to my heart? What is it in my spirit that really is tickled at that or that it feels really as resonates with that? All right, let's talk about poems. Um, poems are first and foremost just your fingerprints on the world. <coughs> poems are your way of saying, I'm here. <clears throat> and they are a chance to experiment with language. Uh, how it sounds, how, how they feel on your mouth. Um, poems are also ways that we can capture a universal feeling about something. I, uh, I traveled a lot with uh, Baki Graduate University and I was gone 40 to 60 percent of my life and so after a while I was funny I'd be in an airport waiting and you just try to fill your time and I these haiku <coughs> would start coming to me Do you know what a haiku is a haiku is a Japanese form of poetry a haiku has three lines the first line is uh, five syllables the second line is seven syllables the third line is five syllables and in in the incorrect haiku, there should always be an opaque reference to the season. It doesn't have to be opaque, but you know, um, to be a direct reference. But there are a lot of ways to in, intuit what season it is by reading the haiku. And so, well, to, you know, I just kept writing these things. And after four years with Baki, I look back and think, oh my gosh, I've got 75 haikus. <laughs> and what, what, about, what is it about haiku when I travel? Why, why haiku? They're so simple uh, in their construction, you know. Here's one. In the fall, I fly. You will work and I will fly. It's what we do now. In the fall, I fly. You will work and I will fly. It's what we do now. You see, what I was experiencing there was loneliness yeah. and, and ambivalence about this rhythm that was in our life now. Um, I leave, I come, Tina's normal work, and you know, it just kind of goes on. It didn't feel right. Something about that didn't feel right. Mm. And I was wrestling with that a little bit. I mean, this is one of 75. 
haiku like this, mm. right? And other, you know, there are other silly ones too, but um, this is meaningful to me. I don't know if it's meaningful to anybody else. Um, if I ever try to publish a book of haiku, I guess the pudding, the proof of the pudding will be in the tasting, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to buy this stuff? Yeah. I won't know until then, but it had value, uh, helping me process my own stuff. Very few of our own poems will be meaningful to other people, mm -hmm. partly because they're badly written, <laughs> but partly because what we're conveying is so intimate and so personal that no one else gets the inside joke, mm -hmm. or the inside irony, or the inside pain. Or, mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Po poetry is really the language of the heart. Fiction, novels, um, huge, uh, you know, I, I've already covered a little bit. Let me just say, let me just reiterate that fiction is uh, another way of telling the truth. And the scriptures themselves use fiction. And we have to get this idea out of our heads that because it's not true, it isn't true. <laughs> because somebody made this story up, it's not true. <clears throat> Now, fiction be is, is a very dangerous uh, medium for this reason. Yeah. It, it ha it's, a, it's a powerful medium. It has power that nonfiction doesn't have, actually. Mm -hmm. And therefore, responsibility goes way up if you're going to write fiction. Your stewardship of this process becomes more important. Are you going to tell the truth, or are you just going to get the good line? Mm -hmm. Right? Is the truth you're telling in this story consistent with your calling, what you know to be true, the experience you're trying to relate, etc.? Is it? Or are you just doing something that you know will sell? Mm. These are the questions you'll be faced with if you moved into, move into fiction. Recently I've been reading short stories. This is a book written by Alice Munro. She's the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. You know, it's worth paying attention to who wins the Nobel Prize, right? Mm. She wrote short stories in this one. Short stories. It's not an entire book. There are about five short stories in here, each about 30 pages. Short stories are really powerful. Mm -hmm. I think short stories are a medium churches could use, actually. Because mm -hmm. they can be told in the space of a Sunday, mm -hmm. in a Sunday school format or an adult education kind of format. Somebody who had the gift of writing short stories mm -hmm. could really convey something that's true in the short space of a time, because it doesn't take a whole novel to develop. And it, it leaves you, I've been thinking about the short stories that she's been telling. I can't say that I am a big fan, that I like the messages she's giving. They unsettle me a little bit. <laughs> but that just tells you about the power of the short story right there. It's like, oh, I'll read this because I know I'll get through that whole story before I go to bed tonight. Sure. It's going to take me maybe 30 minutes. I can do that, and I get the whole story. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's it's a powerful uh, medium, still in the realm of fiction. Articles, a lot of you have um, had experience with this because you do this for your work or you do this for your ministry. Uh, let me just encourage and challenge you to um, give yourself enough time for an article that you let it sit for a few days after you've finished it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then go back and ask the creative question, is this interesting or just information? Um, most of us are so busy in our ministries, it, it's all we can do to get the article out in time for the deadline. You know, um, Christmas is coming, and people donate to my ministry. Therefore, I need to get my Christmas prayer letter out by no later than December 4th. In order to have it out by December 4th, I have to have it written before Thanksgiving give enough time to you know get it to the printer and all that kind of stuff and that deadline plays in my head <laughs> and so I'm writing this article writing this article writing this article, oh, I'm done and then I want to get that thing to Jeanette and have her get get it going right but I need to let that thing sit to ask myself is this good writing mm -hmm. will anybody want to actually read this because it's interesting not just because it's noble and yeah. we're doing good things for Jesus but because yeah. it's well written mm -hmm. Because the likelihood of them getting the message of what we're doing for Jesus goes way up if, if it's a well-written article. So you have to give yourself a little extra time. And then, of course, there are editorials. If you want to practice, 
cost you nothing, guarantee of publication, write to the Fresno Bee. Because you've only got 200 words, and you've got to say something in 200 words. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that little limitation right there is not easy. Uh, but that's why the sonnet as a poem is such a beautiful uh, thing, that, because it's limited. You know, <clears throat> a sonnet, it has 10 syllables in each line, a hembic pentameter, and an epigram at the end. Every sonnet is like that. It has to be in that form. To some people, that's like a jail. I have to <laughs> write something creative inside this, you know, boundary. But for other people, that opens up all sorts of possibilities. Mm. And so I encourage you, write letters to the editor because this forces you to do something really good but within a very limited space. And it's really a good discipline for a writer, for somebody who wants to write. Okay. Let's talk about now the art and the discipline of writing. Um, the first aspect of the art and discipline of writing is that you become a, a student of the power of words. Dorothy Sayers, one of my favorite um, English novelists, she was talking about John Bunyan, of course, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And she said, his every word is like a living thing, full of light and moving in its place, like a dancer. But one has to love words before they will dance a step. Mm -hmm. Love them, I mean, not for what one can compel them to do, but for what they are in themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you love words? Do you love the way they sound on your tongue? Or when one word tumbles into another, how that combination feels when, you, when it rolls off your tongue? Similarly, similarly uh, Annie Dillard, she extends that to sentences. Let me read this to you. A well-known writer who got collared by a university student asked, do you think I could be a writer? Well, the writer said, I don't know. Do you like sentences? <laughs> the writer could see the student's amazement. Sentences? Do I like sentences? I'm 20 years old, and do I like sentences? If he had liked sentences, of course, he could begin. Like a joyful painter, I knew. I asked him how he came to be a painter, and he said, I like the smell of paint. Mm -hmm. Wow. So do you like sentences? Huh. If you like sentences, you could be a writer. Hmm. <laughs> I, we make this much more complicated wow. than it is. Hmm. Do you like sentences? Um, and then uh, <clears throat> we, we want to fall in love with the way words <clears throat> sound. Uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins coined a phrase that he used to describe the rhyming scheme in his poetry. He called it sprung rhythm. And it's because it was an odd meter. And it would interrupt. And he would put the rhyming words in, in the strangest places. Mm. Um, let, me, let me give you an example of mm. this odd rhythm. And what this does, when you try to say these words, you feel them in your mouth, the way they roll <laughs> out of your mouth, okay? Now he's, this is an amazing poem, which is about being who and what you were intended to be. See mm -hmm. if you can catch it. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As Tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. It deals out that being indoors, each one dwells, selves, goes itself. Myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ, for Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his to the Father through the feature of men's faces. Hmm. Wow. You look at each of you in here, wow. you are Christ. Hmm. 
in a way that no one else can be the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so be that. If you're a bell, you ring. Mm -hmm. If you're a stone tossed down a well, it's going to sound a note yeah. as it hits all the way down. The kingfisher can, it is what it is in a way that nothing else can be. And it's mm -hmm. all about Christ playing in 10,000 places. Wow. Right? What an image. Wow. And what rhythm in here. Wow. And he said it in a way that couldn't have been said anywhere else. Wow. So words become oh. something that mm -hmm. they weren't before when they're placed in juxtaposition with each other. Words become a symbol of something. And that image stays with us forever. One of the times I saw my dad cry was when he was reciting words. <coughs> famous poem about the daffodils. Uh, you've heard the first line, I, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Maybe you haven't. It's, you know, I don't know if people here in Fresno, California re read Wordsworth. But let me read this poem to you and imagine what would make a 60-year-old man weep as he... Wordsworth's sister Dorothy tells the story of how this poem came to be. They were walking by a lake one time and they just saw this massive field of daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and Twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand I saw at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. On the waves beside them they danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be happy in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure, pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Hmm. He's saying, in times when wow. I'm feeling alone or lonely or just despondent or, or in a gloom, all I have to do is think about that hillside and this mass wind moving this array of daffodils. And he says, something that happened there suddenly transported here. And I'm feeling that now. And that changes my reality now. And I can dance with the daffodils. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so these images become a symbol for something. Forever daffodils then became a symbol of joy. Mm -hmm. Words do that. Words enter a culture. Um, I, you know, I was raised around parents who recited poetry, and I can still remember my dad uh, and a lot of his friends used to recite the same poem. It went like this. Jenny kissed me when we met, jumping from the chair she sat in. Time, you thief, who love to get sweets into your list, put that in. <laughs> say I'm weary, say I'm sad, Say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm growing old, but add, Jenny kissed me. Hmm. So a whole generation of people <laughs> memorized that poem. Wow. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Wow. What? Have you ever heard that poem? No. No. I've never heard it. <laughs> Lay Hunt. I, you know, a whole generation, because it somehow captured something mm. after the Depression. Mm. It captured this, you know what? Life isn't always what you want, but... Hold on to a couple of really good things that happened to you. Yeah. You know? It, it conveyed that. And so Jenny Kissed Me became uh -huh. this reminder. That's what writing does. It reminds us to hold on to the things mm -hmm. that are good and beautiful. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so develop a discipline of writing something every day, just like Pat was saying. Just write something, but choose your subject. One that doesn't matter, and one that does matter. Mm. Write something every day. Choose your subject, one that doesn't matter, and one that does matter. 
<clears throat> the one that doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just that it matters to you and maybe not to a lot of other people. Because this is the one that's going to come up from inside of you. This is the creative one. Choose one that matters to other people, to your ministry, to your work, to your relationships, uh, to your vocation. And if you keep that balance in your writing, the writing that's for you, the writing that's for others, the writing that really doesn't matter, is just for the act and the love of it, and the writing that really does matter because something is going to come of this. That's going to be a healthy balance um, in your experience. <clears throat> and then finally, I really encourage you to find a writer's group um, because of the peer learning that happens there. <clears throat> what I don't mean by this is people who will read what you've written. I don't mean getting a group of friends together and say, what do you think about this? Because your friends will just lie to you. They'll just, they don't want to hurt your feelings. And they'll just say, yeah, it's great. But you want to get with a group of people that are trying to improve their craft. And so that can be two or three. I have a writing group. Um, we gather infrequently <coughs> and we ask when we have things to read to each other. And then you know, we read each other's stuff and we comment on it. And we're committed to telling the truth. We try to encourage, but we also try to say, here's where I think it's lacking or, or weak or needs a little bit more um, work. Okay, pay attention to the quality of what you do. Um, so, <clears throat> let me see if you could put the... Uh, if I add the word only to that sentence, <laughs> Where should I add it? <laughs> Changes the meat, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I could add it here. Yeah. Only I will love you. And what am I saying mm -hmm. if I put the only I there? I alone. It kind of implies that no one else no. could yeah. love you. Yeah. Yeah. Only I. Yeah. Will love you. Yeah. Right. Um. All right. Let's 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 put it somewhere else. <clears throat> How about if we put it, uh, I only. Hmm. I only will love you. I only will love you. Hmm. Sounds a little injured, doesn't he? Hmm. Like, well, what are you going to do? Well, I only will love you. Hmm. See what I'm saying? The tone mm -hmm. can completely change if you put the only uh, there. What if I put it here? I will love only you. Yeah, that's your focus, just you. That's okay, so this is a promise of monogamy, yeah. right? So, you know, the placement of words really matter, and I, I feel like we've gotten very careless with the placement of words yeah. in our that's, writing. Well, that's and we have to ask. I mean, you know, there are a lot of other ways to do this. For example, let's... Here's a sentence for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the difference between that and this? Yeah. <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> Let's eat kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cannibalism. A lot of years in prison, kids. that's what that is. A lot of years in prison, yeah. <laughs> Cannibalism. Right, exactly. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, save a life. Use a comma. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Really? Okay, because punctuation, grammar, there's a reason for these things. Yeah. And what's the reason? The reason is because we, we, um, we need guidelines to help our communication be more accurate. <clears throat> You've noticed all the creative spelling these days. Mm -hmm. and it started with boys in the hood, B-O-Y-Z yeah. in the hood. <laughs> all right? And that's all fine. It's all about creativity. That's good. Um, I'll never forget the first time I was in a national meeting <clears throat> where uh, our African-American staff 
uh, were sitting in the front row, and there was a white speaker speaking. And the, the uh, white speaker was pretty used to African American call and response. Hmm. All right, so he, he was okay with that. Hmm. But the first response he got from one of the staff sitting in the front row, row was, shut up! <laughs> and we all know that's that's totally valid these days. That's a valid way of saying, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. good. All right, yes. that's good. Yeah, yeah. keep going. Right on. right on. But this white speaker had never heard that. <laughs> that was, <hard. laughs> was that helpful to the white speaker? <laughs> the staff worker was trying to encourage the white speaker, but the white speaker wasn't in on it. He didn't know. And when you really think about it, slang excludes people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Slang excludes mm -hmm. until you're in the in crowd. And you now you know the slang, and so you're okay. But the very first thing slang does is exclude. So mm -hmm. this stuff matters. Yeah. If we're going to convey accurately without having to go back and forth five times before we finally get a meeting of the minds here, Yeah. We've got to find a way to say what we mean in a way that someone can appreciate. Therefore, <clears throat> knowing your audience yes. is so crucial when you write. Mm -hmm. That's the first question a publisher will ask you. Who are you <clears throat> writing this for? And your answer cannot be everyone. Because the publisher won't believe you. Mm -hmm. It's not possible that you can write something that is universally mm -hmm. accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, God might be able to speak to people that way, but we're human, and we're so limited by culture and language. <clears throat> so we've got to ask, who's my audience? Mm -hmm. And if my audience can, can understand and appreciate, shut up! <laughs> Fine! Mm -hmm. But if, if I'm attempting to cross a bridge here and reach an audience that may not understand my world, I've got to work extra hard now. Mm -hmm to educate and to incorporate things that can be appreciated. So you've got to ask yourself, who's your audience? And then you've got to get other people to pay attention to your stuff. And this mm -hmm. is where having an editor and a second set of eyes mm -hmm. becomes really important in your writing. One of the greatest <clears throat> uh, tools that, that every serious writer ought to employ is the eyes of an editor. And by an editor, I don't, again, I don't mean your friends. I mean, mm -hmm. If you're trying to write something serious, it's actually worth paying an editor mm -hmm. to take a separate look. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a rate, they'll charge, you know, whatever, a few dollars a page, up to a lot of dollars a page. But um, that can, they'll ask you, did you intend this to mean this? It'll be quite a revelation to you what you think your language means and what huh. the editor thinks you, wow. your language means. So having an editor can be um, really important. Let's do a little exercise here. Um, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story, but I'm only going to go so far, <laughs> and then <clears throat> you're going to pick the story up and tell the next part. John was sitting at his desk, and he had just closed his book, and it started to put his books into his backpack. But when he turned around, swinging the Backpack onto his shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all I have, Pat. Can you continue for me? He inadvertently hit the girl behind him, who fell on the floor, and looked there. And he looked terribly embarrassed. Um, and what happened next, Kathy? I don't know. <laughs> he. Reached down to help her up and um, just said, Hey, sorry, I'm checking out. Uh, are you okay? And, and she said, Am I okay? No, I'm not okay. This is a brand new outfit, brand new shoes. I have an important meeting to go to, and now I'm going to be late because I have to clean up myself. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm just flustered right now, and I've had a horrible day, and you just made it worse, mister. What do you have to say for yourself? And John said, 
And John said, I apologize, it was an accident. But then she cracked a smile as she was joking with him because none of that was true. Mm. And she blushed because she was the girl that had a crush on John. Woo! All right. Okay. <laughs> That's good. And before you know it, um, John knelt down to help her off the floor, not paying attention that his bag <laughs> swung back around his shoulder, um, landing square in her lap. This has become comedy now. And, <laughs> and she was like, are you an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> and to which he replied, No, I'm not. <laughs> Need a little bit better dialogue than this. <laughs> no, I'm not an idiot. I'm just, I'm just flustered by your beauty. And oh my oh. God! Get the soft switch. And then what happened? She couldn't help but blush at that, um, and seemed to forget that the heavy book bag was on her lap until she tried to get up. Mm -hmm. And then the books just spilled everywhere, and John and she hurried to pick them up and accidentally touch hands. And they looked up into each other's eyes, <laughs> and they looked happily at each other. <laughs> That's good. I realized all the literature was was um, one literature they both loved. <laughs> well, that's good because when it came back to me, I was going to say, <clears throat> and John said, I, "There's something I need to tell you. I'm 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 actually a woman." <laughs> um. And she said, "Perfect." <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's all ended the same way. <laughs> we need other people sometimes to stimulate thoughts that we wouldn't yes. have ourselves, right? And a stupid little exercise like that sometimes helps us remember, you know what, maybe writing shouldn't be a solitary activity. Why did all of the, the writers of the, um, the modernist movement in Europe why did they all gather in coffee shops yeah. with each other? Yep. There were these artists' communities, and Hemingway was one of them, yeah. many others. They gathered in communities to run ideas off of each other. They all go back to their rooms and write yeah. based on these conversations and involvement uh, in the real world. <coughs> so uh, find ways to get connected to a creative community that can stimulate something in you that pulls something out of you that might not have been. Uh, there otherwise. All right, let me finish by talking a little bit about publishing. Um, there are several forms of publishing, and so the most traditional form is, is, is a standard uh, publisher contract. These two books were written with a standard publisher, a traditional publisher, I should say, <coughs> and there are many of them, you know, in, in all sorts of categories of writers, academic writing, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and each of these have um, rules, and if you want to write within a genre in a tradition, for a traditional publisher, you have to become aware of those rules. So for example, that publisher was uh, IVP, and they have a style guide. Mm -hmm. um, Every publisher does. If you want, if you say to yourself, um, I'd love to write for Erdman's, or I'd love to write for Random House, or I'd love to write for <clears throat> whatever. Even if you're writing for a journal, uh, a periodical, like The New Yorker, or The Atlantic Monthly, or Time, they've all got style guides. And it means if you don't really submit with the style um, that they are requesting, they, they wouldn't even take a look at it. Mm -hmm. So learn the expectations of the publisher that your your interest uh, that you're interested in and they they'll have um, like this one for example here here are some tips for how to be your own copy editor mm -hmm. and you know it's actually quite helpful stuff that 
it would take way too long for us to, to do all the mechanics today. Uh, I hope you haven't hoped that you were just need a lot of mechanics today. Mm -hmm. These are things you can get from any publisher, uh, anytime, anywhere, online. Far easier today than when I started writing. So all that, that kind of information is available to you. But he does deals with basic stuff like when in doubt, cut it out. Don't use six words when two words will do. Um, replace long words with short ones. Convert passive voice to active. Get rid of lazy language. You know, so there are every publisher will have its own tips, have its own style guide, and um, I encourage you to think about uh, uh, finding ways to make your writing match that <clears throat> that requirement. When you're writing uh, for a traditional publisher, you need a cover letter, you need to identify your target audience, you need an amplified outline, and usually you need two sample chapters. So most people don't write an entire book now, mm -hmm. hoping that when they're done with it, they, they'll be able to um, you know, uh, find an editor, or find a, a publisher, except in novels. Usually novels are written in their entirety. <clears throat> but especially for nonfiction, if you've got an idea for a book, what the publisher will ask of you is a cover letter explaining what it is. An amplified outline means the, the titles of the chapters and what the chapter is about, just a paragraph. And then um, uh, a, uh, um, a sample, two sample chapters, so they can actually see the quality of your writing. And that's enough to get it in front of the traditional publisher. Now, mo many publishers these days don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. Mm. And so it, it really does matter who you know, and, and mm -hmm. you've got to milk all of your connections. Even if the person you know is an author, maybe they're a pastor, a prominent pastor, they've published something, and if they can <coughs> write a letter on your behalf to a publisher saying, hey, here's a talented young writer, mm -hmm. please would you review their manuscript? I'm just saying these days there's so much competition in the, yeah. the world of publishing that um, that really helps to, to try to find some inroad that way. Mm. Unsolicited manuscripts, I mean just the 80% of them, 90% of them uh, just go into the, the rent file mm. <laughs> because they don't have time. They get thousands of them. Mm -hmm. mm. There you That's go. Jameson. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Self-publishing. Self-publishing is when you, you work through a company that will print your book and um, you have to pay all the costs. Sometimes you pay for the artwork, the setup, the ISBN number, <coughs> all of that. And um, there's an upfront fee for all of that. And then um, uh, you, you pay for a certain number of books to be printed, and then you're really responsible for selling, selling. books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if, you know, people for a long time have, have um, poo pooed self publishing because it's like you've heard it, it's called vanity publishing. Mm. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. Hi, Ginger. <laughs> and so um, the, 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 the problem with vanity publishing is that usually there's no editorial process. Mm. The person who couldn't get it published through a traditional publisher says, I'm just going to publish it anyway, even if it isn't any good. Mm. And, and so the quality of self-published materials is often poor. Yeah. If you want to go that route, and there are times when that's really appropriate. This book used a hybrid publisher as a form of self-publishing. But it was because we weren't trying to market the book. This book was going to be distributed to every pastor mm -hmm. in Fresno, and we, we raised money mm -hmm. to be able to make sure that every pastor in Fresno got a copy of this book written by this committee of people uh, because it was setting up a whole process down the road. We, want to, we didn't want to market it in the way that, well, we hope people buy this book. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, this book's going to go to every, we've already raised the money for that to happen. So mm -hmm. that kind of publisher made a lot of sense for this book. But this book, was done through a hybrid publisher. This is like a traditional publisher. So there's a fee up front for the artwork and for the ISBN and all that kind of stuff. But then we didn't have to um, print all the books ourselves. Mm -hmm. We had to guarantee that we would buy at least 50 <coughs> copies. Mm -hmm. But after that, I mean, you can buy this book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And Amazon for Kindle, especially. 
Mm -hmm. So um, there are, there are, there's an array of publishers out there now from traditional uh, to hybrid to self-publishing. And some of them make sense for different kinds of situations, depending on what your purpose is um, for the book that's being published. I think everybody's you know, ideal is being published by a traditional uh, publisher. And <clears throat> once you've published something, then yeah. by a traditional publisher, then other publishers will take a look at you. Mm -hmm. Because you're a published author, somebody took a chance on you, it's the publisher taking the risk, they mm -hmm. might even have paid you in advance. Yeah. Um, and that gives you a vote of approval, basically, that another publisher could, could take a big look at you. Um, we talked about newspapers, talked about blogs, and we talked about periodicals. In, if you get to a point where, and, and this is what I'm going to do with this book, this is a novel. I've never written a novel before. That makes me a first time novelist. Mm -hmm. um, even if I think it's very good, because there's a lot of competition out there, um, I've decided to employ an agent for mm -hmm. this novel. Mm -hmm. And what I'll, I'll say to the agent, okay, go find me a publisher. Mm -hmm. I'll pay the agent a percentage of whatever royalties I would get after publication. He might even have an upfront fee. I'll pay that because the agent knows the markets, mm -hmm. knows the publishers, he knows he'll read the book and figure out, oh, this fits in this category, I'll go to these publishers. Huh. I don't know anything about that. I mean, I, I know a few publishers, but he would know them far better because in, he's an agent, he knows how to negotiate as well. Hmm. So some things you're going to write, um, you know, get a professional. If you really believe in it and you think it needs to be for a wide audience and it, and it needs to be from a traditional publisher, then it, it's paying a professional to do that is going to get you much further than you as a first-time author mm -hmm. on your own. You know, for something right. like this, I would never do that. For a, a non-fiction book like that, I would never do that. I was going to say, Randy, The Shack was self-published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of books were. And yeah, then you got I mean, it was a bestseller. I mean, yeah. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes self-publishing can lead to a traditional publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody picks you up because they see, wow, that thing's selling like hotcakes. So uh, they'll, they'll go for that. Okay, let me just uh, finish by talking about um, writing resources. Um, you might want to make notes about this. There's a writer's Facebook page, and I found it really helpful. You get into the lives of writers. <laughs> just, looks for, just look for the word writers on Facebook. Uh, Writing.com also has a Facebook page, and that's, that's more the story of the writer themselves. The first one was more the um, great things that are happening in the world of publishing. But second one, more about the writers themselves, writing.com. Third one is Poets and Writers, and this is just pw.org, pw.org. Um, another one is practicalcreativewriting.com. And they have really helpful tips on that one. Exercises you can do, all sorts of stuff like that. PracticalCreativeWriting.com. Um, let me just share again. You know, the, the Writing Life by Andy Dillard, the complete handbook of novel writing. This book here, uh, A Syllable of Water: Twenty Writers of Faith Reflect on Their Art. This is a beautiful book, mm -hmm. by the way, in all genres mm -hmm. of writing. And then a classic is this book, If You Want to Write, by Brenda Hewland. It's huh. a beautifully written book. Huh. I absolutely love this, this book. Yeah. Um, really, the art and the craft of writing and the, and the soul of writing as well. <clears throat> Andy Dillard says, don't worry about how you feel about your writing as you go. She says, um, <clears throat> well, now I can't keep track of it. Here we go. There's neither a proportional relationship nor an inverse one between a writer's estimation of a work in progress and its actual quality. Mm. The feeling that the work is magnificent and the feeling that it is abominable are both mosquitoes to be repelled, <laughs> ignored, or killed, wow. not indulged. Mm. Right? Wow. That's good. Brenda Euland says, writing is not a performance but a generosity. Mm. We are sharing something we've been given. 
It is the gift of our true self. We must get in touch with who we really are. That's good. And above all, let me read this quote to you. Above all, never, never lie to yourself. Hmm. Don't lie to others, but least of all to yourself. What do you really care about and love? Who are you? And one of the very worst self-murdering lies that people tell to themselves <clears throat> is that they are no good and have no gift and nothing important to say. Hmm. Now it's Fyodor Dostoevsky, wow. who that, the famous Russian uh, writer. That's really good. Here's C.S. Lewis's um, advice to a young writer. Always try to use the language so as to make quite clear what you mean and make sure your sentence couldn't mean anything else. Always prefer the plain, direct word to the long, vague one. Don't implement promises, but keep promises. Mm. Never use abstract nouns when concrete ones will do. If you mean more people died, don't say mortality rose. <laughs> In writing, don't use adjectives which merely tell us how you want us to feel about the thing you're describing. I mean, instead of telling us the thing was terrible, describe it so that we'll be terrified. Mm. Don't say it was delightful. Make us say delightful when we read the description. Mm. You see, all those wow. words, horrifying, wonderful, hideous, exquisite, are only like saying to your readers, please, will you do my job for me? Wow. Wow. See what I'm saying? That's good. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Don't use words too big for the subject. Don't say infinitely when you mean very. Otherwise, you'll have no word left when you want to talk about something really yeah. infinite. Right. That's <laughs> that is good. So all of these things are like saying, remember, words matter. Wow. Words matter. That is so good. Go back and read it again. Is that really what you wanted to say, or is there a better way to mm. say it? So, that in conclusion, so I encourage you to write. I encourage you to meet with others who are writing. We don't need more opinions and words in this world. We need more people who love language, mm. who are living out their true selves, and who are ablaze with passion for the true and the beautiful. And if that is you, then people will surely want to come and watch you burn. Mm. I think I'll quit there. So good. <clears throat> so good. What I didn't have time to share with you today is something called mind mapping. Mind mapping is a way to write on a subject. You put the subject in the middle of the page, and you create some shoots off of there for the main subpoints, and every one of the shoots has its own subpoint. And that's just a way for you to organize your thoughts. So here, this was about health, so they thought, okay, well, what affects health? Stress does, exercise does, diet does, sleep does. So those are the major subpoints, and then each of those subpoints has some other subpoints. It's just a way to help you visualize um, what you're trying to write about. That's great. What a gift! Wow! 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 What a gift! And we don't take this for granted at all, Randy. Thank you so much for for pouring into us um, in this way today. Wow! Thanks for So wow. Um, so if you know people who are not here today and they want access to, to everything that was shared, uh, we'll be posting it on the website or on yeah we'll be we'll post it on the YouTube page um, as soon as possible um, and and then we'll we'll go from there. Um, yeah. Wow. Thoughts, comments. Just a little bit that I um, that, that I came in on at the latter part of it. Um, I just apologize for walking in so late, and there was no way I could get off my try. Yeah. But just that little portion that I heard, that was a lot well, of information. I was yeah. just like, oh my God, just, and I appreciate the fact that he was just able to come out and yeah. just share that. And yeah. I'm sure there's going to be more, and I would definitely wait for that to come on and watch it. Absolutely. That's what I heard was enough for me right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that would be just run with that. Good. Wow, that's good. awesome. Good. Anyone else? Final thoughts, comments? Yes. Um, the part where you mentioned right every day, 
subject that matters or yes. doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. When you initially said it, the one that does matter is like, okay, the one that matters to me. The one that doesn't matter, like, oh, okay. But when you switched it to the one that doesn't matter is the one that's for you. Mm. It kind of also puts more responsibility on the writer because, like, what you have to say may not be that important. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you have to realize that. Yeah. 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 It's good. It's good. Getting clear on who you're writing for right now. Is this for me? Yeah. Or is this for others? People. Yeah. That's <coughs> great. Rules right there. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So we will be in, in, in contact with you, Randy, and perhaps uh, we will have to offer this again um, next year sometime. Um, so, yeah, thank you again so much for... Yes, go pick up your wife, and um, we'll close out in prayer. Katie, can you just, just close this out? Yeah. Father, we thank you for um, blessing us with this opportunity just to listen to Randy. And, uh, we thank you for blessing him with, with the mind that you have and for giving him the willingness to express it to us and um, with such elegance and, and understanding and depth to it. And we just thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to soak up all that we've soaked up, God. And I just ask that as we leave that we would um, not just hear this and be inspired you know, for the moment, but that it would be something that um, is deeply rooted in our yes. um, experiences as writers in general and in life. Yes. Um, and we just thank you for the opportunity that you bless us with. I ask that um, you would continue to use Randy to uh, speak to other people as well, and that you would use us to give what we've learned to other people. And um, in the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen.